Oh, that was nice. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> All right, welcome. My name is Dr. Portia Moore. I'm in the Inclusion Catalyst at the Columbia Museum of Art. I also co-create a project called The Visitors of Color. <laughs> and <laughs> I wanted to begin tonight with a poem by the uh, abolitionist, the black abolitionist, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. Make me a grave wherever you will in a lonely plain or a lofty hill. Make it among earth's humblest graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. I could not rest if around my grave I heard the steps of a trembling slave. His shadow above my silent tomb would make it a place of fearful gloom. I could not rest if I heard the tread of a coffle gang to the shambles led and the mother's shriek of wild despair rise like a curse on the trembling air. I could not sleep if I saw the lash drinking her blood at each fearful gash and I saw her babes torn from her breast like trembling doves from their parent nest. I'd shudder and start if I heard the bay of bloodhounds seizing their human prey, and I heard the captive plead in vain as they bound afresh his galling chain. If I saw young girls from their mother's arms bartered and sold for their youthful charms, my eye would flash with a mournful flame, my death pale cheek grow red with shame. I would sleep, dear friends, where bloated might can rob no man of his dearest right. My rest shall be calm in any grave, where none can call his brother a slave. I ask no monument proud and high to arrest the gaze of the passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. And again, that's Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Tonight, we're going to be talking about how to interpret slavery in a historic city. We have an esteemed panel of guests, and I wanted to begin our conversation with what Christy Coleman, who is the director of the American Civil War Museum, says are the three elephants in the room when we talk about interpreting slavery. The first elephant in the room is the idea of scholarship, so thinking about what is known. The second elephant in the room is the idea or concept of heritage. What did your daddy and your grandfather and your father's father tell you and leave to you as a legacy? And then finally, the third elephant in the room is the idea of memory and cultural memory and how that complicates this idea of how we can interpret history. Did you know that in America there are 11,000 Starbucks? and that there are 14,000 McDonald's. And currently there are over 35,000 museums and about half of that number represent um, historic sites and what we call small museums, so historic house uh, museums. And for me that number is, those figures are significant because it means that in some way we deeply care in this country about the notion and idea of history. But when we talk about interpreting slavery, what we need to start thinking about is whose history and whose narratives. So without further ado, so that we can begin our conversation, I want to welcome our panelists, and I will have them sort of introduce themselves and give a five-minute um, introduction of the work that they're doing at their individual institutions. So we'll start with Jamal. Good evening. Good, evening. Good afternoon. Greetings. Salutations with the name of the Most High. I'm Dr. Jamal Ture. I am on the board for the George Lyle Vision Association at First African Baptist Church. Uh, we are the nonprofit for First African, the secular arm of First African Baptist Church. And I have to do this, I have to be um, proper. And I have someone just came in, our former mayor, Dr. Otis Johnson, who also is a former member of the George Lyle Vision uh, Board. So give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, those of you who don't know me know that I believe in paying homage to those who laid a path for us to follow and also show respect and honor. So when I say, give them a round of applause, some of you from Savannah, we would not be here right now if it was not for the city of Savannah funding for this event. So we have to understand that always, and that's what I'm about. And I do several things in this area, but I'm here for George Lau Vision and First African Baptist Church. So again, what I'm about with regards to our stories. Our story at First African Baptist Church was about, I tell folks, it is an international story. Now many of our facilities deal with international stories. All of them, in fact, deal with the story of people being brought here when we talk about captive Africans. But, as I share folks this, First African is different in the sense that it's not about the importation of the story, we export the story also. Because First African Baptist Church is an international church. Some say, oh, it is the oldest church in North, African church in North America, the oldest black church in North America, the oldest continuous black church in North America. I tell folks, no, it is international in scope because the story of First African is not just tied to North America, but it's also tied to the Caribbean and also to Africa. Not where the story just comes into Savannah, it goes out of Savannah to those other places, which makes it unique. So it's not just about coming into, the, into Savannah telling the story, we leave out of here. And one of the people is Father George Lau, who's called the first missionary in North America. Not African missionary or Caucasian, he's the first missionary in all of North America. So he leaves from Savannah, he goes to the Caribbean and starts the movement down there in the Caribbean. There's another person that's important to First African history, but many do not know about him, and that's Reverend David George. George also leave from Savannah, but going to a place called Halifax and Burston in Canada. Again, taking the story from here to Canada. But it doesn't stop there. The story then goes on to Sierra Leone, to Freetown. And it's basically starting a church there we know today as Regent Road Baptist Church, the oldest black church in West Africa. And Brother Amos also leads from this area here going to the Bahamas. So again, First African is unique in the sense that our story is not just tied here, and it's an international story, but it's not one just about importation, but exporting, and that's unique for us. So with that and understanding all of that, we have to be about some things I say we must always have fo be, be focused on. Respect, responsibility, and exploration. Many times we tell the stories of the people who are captive Africans, but we do not respect them and their stories and their lives. Again, as Portia said, Dr. Portia said, with regards to the narratives, the narratives that have been told, and I often tell people we focus more on American mythology as opposed to American history. <laughs> Again, American mythology, we focus on, and we know that, and we regurgitate that. And what happens so often that people now have the wrong ideas about these people. Because again, they forget that they're people with stories, with lives, that must be told accurately, not the stereotypes, not the gone with the wind history, the happy-go-lucky African, the one that did not have any feelings. No, they all had a story that's important that must be told. And it's the responsibility of any docents, any historians, any museum, any historic site to tell the story accurately and tell the fullness of the story. And some are gonna say, well, me, and I have to go and say this, I talk, when I'm doing, I'm talking about my ancestors. And now there are some academics and some intellectuals and some historians who are going to say, you cannot put yourself inside that story, that landscape of that story. That's incorrect. On the African tradition, the historian must be a part of the story. And what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to know all the story. We're supposed to know the good parts and the negative sides to the story. And then we can be the ones to go and tell that, because we tell it honestly, because we understand the story is not about us, it's about the people. And when you're at these sites, you must tell the story of the people, not about yourself. Not the narratives of those people who want to tell uh, the wonderful story of a plantation owner who gave Africans some property and other things like that, but they're not talking about the horrific side to when they lost family members. And we think that if we talk about that, then again, it's expressing someone's character. We must tell the fullness of the story. Because you want me to tell the story when I talk about Africans participating in captivity also. Because again, we find that's a part of the story, even in Savannah, but there's some kinks to that story when you say that solely. And then I talk about responsibility. Responsibility. You have a responsibility to tell the truth. So often we get caught into the mythology, we promote the mythology when we know it's lying, it's incorrect. And also it comes into play because we understand history is about money for many of us. 
When I say money, it's how we make giving our nonprofits. We need the revenue to come in. So we sell the story in a way to make sure that our patrons are happy about the story. In Savannah, we have an issue here that we tell folks we like to talk about the wonderful things and say that there were no Africans in the city of Savannah because Oglethorpe outlawed that. Well, we know that's historically inaccurate. February 9th and February 10th, 1733, Africans were right here for Colonel William Bull helping lay out the streets and the squares in Savannah. But we promoted that because, again, it doesn't sell the story that we want people to hear. Again, your narrative. Exploration, exploration. We must explore. We, must, we can't be afraid of learning more about history. That's the wonderful part of the story. That's the wonderful part of what we do. We're going and gaining more inf insight to use today with regards to us and our framework today to help future generations. That's what we're supposed to be about. No fear in gaining knowledge. We've been told, now I'll give you this, African tradition says this, you must seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. So for some of us who are historians in that African bent, that African mindset, we understand we got to seek knowledge all the time from all facets, all aspects, and then we weave it together and come up with a wonderful tapestry of the history in this area. Yes, at First African Baptist Church, we're about telling the story, respecting the story of the people, being responsible, and also making sure we explore all of the stories, everyone, so we can let everyone see that this is the American story, not just black history, but it's the American history. It's Georgia's history, it's Savannah's history. And I think my time is about up. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Shannon Browning Mullis. I'm the curator of history and decorative arts for Telfair Museums. Uh, and one of our sites is the Owens Thomas House, which you see behind me here. Uh, this property was constructed in 1819. Uh, it's commissioned by a man named Richard Richardson, and he and his family lived there until George Owens purchased it, and so we have been exploring those histories for a very long time. We really interpret the house to the 1820s to the 1840s. This is our carriage house and slave quarters. So we are the only intact urban slave quarters that's really open to the public in Savannah today as such. And with that comes a great responsibility to tell that full story. So over the years uh, since this building was constructed until the Civil War, eight to 14 enslaved people lived in this building at any given time. Of course, when the museum opened in 1954, that's not exactly the story that was being told. Uh, you can see here that these, this building was uh, being used as apartments at that time. So we were telling stories of uh, colonial kitchens and servants rather than enslaved domestic people. Uh, and there is a lovely parterre garden, which is absolutely beautiful, where our original work yard would have been, where enslaved people would have been hanging laundry and uh, tending an herb garden, probably. And over the years, you know, interpretation has evolved, as it has at all sites. So uh, different spaces were added, and by the 1990s, Tenants moved out of the apartments and they wanted to explore this history a little more fully. And you can see here, uh, major work was done in the 1990s. Drop plaster ceilings were removed, walls covering fireplaces came down, and it became evident that the material fabric of the building that was there when enslaved people lived there still existed. So that's the moment that staff at Telfair Museum started to ask themselves, how do we tell this story? Which is, is a large question. Uh, and so I have to point out at this point that since this question has been asked since the 1990s, many people have tried to answer it. So a lot of work has gone into this by many different individuals. So over the years, a lot's happened and we've received a lot of different grants from places like the NEH and the IMLS for the planning phases of the projects that, that have brought this to fruition. And you can see here uh, a publication called Slavery and Freedom in Savannah. In 2011, Telfair Museums convened a group of national and international scholars uh, to explore the questions of uh, what were slavery and freedom like in Savannah history, specifically when possible through the lens of either the Owens Thomas House or the Telfair Academy and the families that lived in those spaces. Um, that research has been incredible for us. It's what we have used uh, going forward to reinterpret those spaces, to reorganize our tours. And as part of that, of course, there's a lot of staff training involved. Uh, there are quite a few of our interpreters here in the room, so you may see some faces up here that you recognize. 
But uh, our interpretive staff has gone through training through the National Association of Interpretation uh, to learn to tell these stories fully and include them in our daily activities. And this year, we are installing the physical exhibits in the basement and the slave quarters and carriage house that go with those stories so that we're fully incorporating everyone who lived and worked there. And I just want to end, I tried to be really brief, uh, I want to end with this census record because you can see that if we leave out the people who were enslaved in this house, we're telling less than half of the history. So when we say we tell a full story or we say we only tell an accurate history, if we're not including everybody who was on this site, we're not really fully doing that. So that's our goal and that's why we want to have this conversation. <coughs> This one, please. Uh, hello, um, my name is Jamie Cradle. I'm the director of the Davenport House Museum, and thank you so much for, for putting this panel together. Um, we just had a birthday at the Davenport House. Our museum opened in 1963 uh, with one floor. Um, and we celebrated the, the, the uh, splendor of the early 19th century with decorative arts and, um, and interiors. And as time passed, um, we've been trying to improve to be better. And in 1985, um, someone from the American Association of Museums came down and did a self stu or a study of the Davenport House to see how we stacked up. And of course, um, she said, well, if you're so concerned with authenticity, why don't you interpret the rooms the way they were tended to be used. Well, that was a dagger to the heart of, um, of the beautiful interiors. And um, so we've been trying to improve. We've had studies done, a furnishings plan, which basically tells people where to put the furniture, and, um, and a biography done of Isaiah Davenport. Um, and, then, um, and then when I got here, in um, too many words, but uh, we have a mission statement that's lofty, um, uh, that we wrote in 2005, which still works for us. These are my marching orders to interpret the American Federal Style House built by the master builder uh, for and with uh, his household. So that's our job, is to talk about the household and the people that lived here in the 1820s. And the reason why we chose that period is that's the period when we have the most information, um, historical information, historical research. And then we also celebrate our role in the founding um, of uh, Historic Savannah Foundation. We're the only house museum that belongs to Historic Savannah Foundation. But I'm, I'm always a bit leery when people talk about being a pioneer. That kind of makes me nervous because we stand on the shoulders of some really uh, powerful uh, scholars. Um, in fact, uh, what Richard Wade wrote of uh, slavery in cities in 1964. Um, so um, lots of historical research is there for us to use and we have to steep ourselves in it um, and make the time to do that. So I just looked at some of the stuff that um, that we look at, but. Um for the entire period that I've been at the Davenport House, um, remember that? Remember those? Do you remember have like um, a, a note card box? <laughs> um, writing on note cards? Well, um, the lady that did the research, um, or our primary research on Isaiah Davenport, if you can see, you can't really see, there's a little folder with about the enslaved people, and we've used that information for the past 25 years. And um, we knew about Nancy who ran away, and and, and Dave who ran away and we knew about their names and we we just didn't think we had enough information. And then in um, 2012, um, I went to the Southeastern Museums Conference's meeting in Colonial Williamsburg where John Franklin, John Hope Franklin's uh, son and Christy Coleman were up on the podium like we are now. And Christy is about my age. She's an icon and she's been in the field. I look quite young, but I'm not. And so she's been, she's been been the field a long time and they asked her, well, like, have you seen the field change? Because she worked at Colonial Williamsburg um, in um, Detroit and now she is the director of the American Civil War Museum. And she said, well, it hasn't changed that much. Curators need to, to do something. It's time, no matter how humble, you've got to do something. And so we started training our people. We didn't think we had enough information, but we started training our docents. How many in here are docents? Raise your hand up high. Um, so we train our docents um, and, um, and 
with the information that we had. Um, and, um, and then um, in 2016, we we're hoping to expand our facility and we invited scholars to come in and critique us, including Jamal and folks from Colonial Williamsburg and folks from close by, folks from Statesboro to tell us well, how they feel that we're interpreting um, the enslaved workers at the Davenport House. What can we do to improve? And they went around and saw the wonderful story that we have to tell in Savannah. It's, it's so authentic. It's a world-class tourist destination and people come here from all over the world and they want a true story. And that's our job to give it to you. So these smart folk came around um, and we ask teachers to critique us. It's sometimes very painful, um, but we um, we try to incorporate um, what they have their critiques of our docent-led tour. Um, but then miracles happen. It's all about timing. I hope you know that. It's all about timing. And so this past year, a, a, a wonderful scholar that said. Um, uh, Georgia Southern Armstrong campus came to us um, wanting a, 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 a project and so her work 140 pages um, we wanted her to research the enslaved people into the present but she didn't have felt like her skills were best served researching the enslaved people that we know back in time so she's researched so we know about um, what's next uh, we know about that Nancy was sold five times before she made it to Isaiah Davenport's household. We know that Bella had four children that they, they got to stay with her for 31 years, but two of them were sold away and used as collateral for loans that Mrs. Davenport took out. We're going to be using this information for the next decades of being able to figure out how to synthesize this material for our story, but it is so authentic and so real and so tied to place that we're very, very excited about that. So again, if you, if you start now, um, it's not too late to tell a story that's worth hearing for everybody that comes to our site. Oh, and um, we um, hope to expand. I can't really say too much more about that um, as far as creating a new exhibit interpretation that, that is, is richer and fuller and, and we might be asking you to help us. Um, but, um, but, um, so, um, but that comes into the future, but just know that we know for sure about the lives, not of nine enslaved people, but of 12, the fact that their lives were interspersed between city and, and, the, and the countryside. And so we hope that this story is enriching because it's our story and, um, and we're excited about sharing it. Thank you. Hello. My name's Sean Halifax, and I'm the only person that's from off. Um, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. I want to thank the Telfair Museums for um, inviting me to come down. Not only am I the only one that's from off, I'm the only one that doesn't work in an urban slavery environment, interpreting urban slavery. I work um, at Charleston County Parks for McLeod Plantation Historic Site. Um, my job there is interpretation, uh, cultural history interpretation coordinator. I oversee all of the public history programs that we do um, within Charleston County Parks. This site is a relatively new site. We're coming up on our third anniversary come April that we've been open. And of course, opening a historic plantation in Charleston, um, that's a tall task. There's already several well-established plantations. The oldest one that's been open to the public the longest opened in 1870 to the public, and that's Magnolia Gardens. Um, so we entered into uh, this market, Charleston County Parks entered into this market um, wanting to figure out, well, what can we do? What can we do that's different? What can we do that looks at um, sites, plantation sites, in a, from a slightly different perspective? So um, if you haven't been to the site, I encourage you to come, but I just wanted to give you a real brief overview of what it is. Um, it's a site whose history goes back to the early 1700s um, as far as it being a plantation, but our interpretation at the site starts relatively late in the 1850s when the McLeod family purchased the property in 1851. Um, we interpret the site from 1851 until 1990, which seems a bit late, but one thing to remember is that the McLeod family lived there until 1990, and so did the descendants of people that the McLeod family enslaved. They were living in these houses that you see here until 1990. 
Um, and just so that you are aware, this is not like out in the country somewhere. This is on Folly Road, the busiest road on James Island, one of the busiest roads in Charleston. Um, so the stories that we tell pick up in 1851 and we cover the last decade of the period of slavery and then we continue on because the site was important during the Civil War. Confederate troops used it as a regimental headquarters and also as a headquarters for all of the troops on James Island for a period of time. Um, United States federal troops used it as a headquarters in 1865 and then following the war it was the James Island um, field office for the Freedmen's Bureau and they were there until about 1870. And then the McLeod family returned to the property, reacquired the property and that's a whole nother long story. Um, they acquired the property, reacquired the property and lived there until 1990 along with um, descendants of people that had been enslaved there. Um, when we set about figuring out what we wanted to do, um, we recognized that in 1860, 96 percent of the population at McLeod were enslaved people. People like the Dawson family, the Forrest family, the Gathers family, um, and to not tell those stories would be not telling the whole story. And so um, our interpretive themes at our site explore how, in particular, African Americans um, have transitioned over a long, it's an unending transition of, from slavery to freedom and what does freedom look like in the 21st century. Um, and how did that play out and what were the relationships of the people that lived at this site. When you come to the site, um, you come into our welcome center. We're not a museum in the typical sense. We don't have any exhibits as far as objects and artifacts on display except for these two that you see here. This was a Sea Island cotton plantation and what you see is a Sea Island cotton gin and a little bateau just suspended from the, um, from the ceiling. And when visitors walk in, they explore what these two different objects might have meant to the different people that inhabited and occupied McLeod at different times from the 1850s till the 1990s. Um, we recommend that when you come out that you uh, take our tours. That's the best way to experience the site. We have a small group of interpreters that are also, uh, that are all trained um, in two different types of interpretive methodology, commemorative museum pedagogy, and um, uh, thematic interpretation. And those are the um, two ways that we approach our interpretation at this site. Um, this is a picture of, of Olivia. She's one of our young interpreters. Um, she does a great job and she's um, leading one of our tours. The second way is to visit this site um, self-guided. We have a variety of ways that you can do that, um, experience this site. So um, just to back up real quick, uh, I mentioned that the, this is relatively new. Charleston County Parks purchased the site in 2000. 11, opened it in 2015, but my first interaction with this site was at about 2001 when I attended a meeting with the executive director of our agency. And at that meeting, we were in discussions with the Historic Charleston Foundation to potentially buy this um, property. And the executive director was new, had been on the job about a year, <coughs> excuse me. And as we left that meeting, we came out of the meeting and he pulled me aside in the parking lot and he said, it's the last thing I do before I retire from this institution is we're going to own Charleston County Parks. And then he had a caveat, he had an addition to that. He said, and we're going to tell the whole truth of what happened there. And so from the very beginning of our um, engagement with this site, beginning in 2001, it was clear that we were going to tell a more whole and complete story. And so as we were doing this, I'm going to share this last slide, and I wasn't sure whether or not to share this because I didn't want to take away from what Dr. Moore might be doing, but I do want to share this slide because it gives us a synopsis and a snapshot of where we have been, and we've alluded to this, um, where we've been when it comes to interpreting sites at like historic house museums um, and uh, plantation sites. And back in the 20th century, and this is still happening today, we have sites whose interpretation is what um, some researchers call a nihilistic interpretation. That's where the stories of the people that were enslaved are lied about, omitted, not acknowledged. And that still happens, unfortunately, today. 
Um, beginning around the 1980s or so, you begin to see a shift, and one of the things that you start to see is you start seeing an acknowledgement of the institution of slavery at these sites. Not that there weren't any sites doing this before, I'm not suggesting that, this is just a general trend, but that, in, that interpretation that was being done at those sites was largely segregated. And so if you wanted to find out what it was like to be an enslaved person at one of those sites, you had to go on what, uh, some sites, and, and then literally this is the name of the tour, the African American Focus Tour. Uh, that's the name of the tour. And what I've seen in my experience, 24 years of doing this, is in the last probably less than a decade really, where uh, sites like mine and like the Owens Thomas House and the Davenport where they're beginning to move towards what I call a corrective narrative, and that's one where it's much more inclusive of all of the folks that are there. And the amazing thing is, is that there's a demand for this. This is something that our public wants. It's what our audiences want. And I think that's why you're seeing, you know, I can't speak for the um, George Leo uh, Church, the first African church, but the two house museums, um, I think that's why you're seeing these movements towards reinterpretation at their sites. All right, thank you, panelists. So I'm going to begin with a really easy question. In our current climate of accusations of fake news and post-truth, how do we, so that wasn't really easy. <laughs> how, do we arrive, how do we arrive at honest, fact-based interpretation of slavery at historic house museums and other sites, which do not leave us open to declarations that our interpretations and new narratives are revisionist histories? So that's not really easy, I was just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody can answer. Uh, well, I, I think the nature of what we do is revisionist. Um, I don't know of anybody that's not a tour guide that has said something and then realized the next day it was wrong. Um, but we try to base our history on, on solid research um, and, and seeking out the truth. Um, so, um, and, um, uh, being accused of being revisionist doesn't keep me up at night. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with Jamie and say that um, really grounding ourselves in the evidence uh, that, that isn't disputable because we have uh, documents and physical evidence to back that up is a really important part of that. Uh, but I would also say that inevitably if somebody desperately wants to find an argument with what you're doing, they will do that. So we have to be prepared for that and committed to our goal as well. I take the position and I shared this with doc, uh, you know, Dr. Lester Jackson, uh, State Senator Lester Jackson. We had a writer from the AJC here and I told them, I said that we are not revising history, we are correcting history. We're correcting history. History was re revised by other people. <laughs> And that's what we're doing. We're dealing with people who revise history. So when someone comes at us and says that you're revising history, I'm like, that's absolutely incorrect. We're correcting history. And that what we have to we have to explore. That's what we're talking about, the point of exploring. Not being afraid to, do, to get the research. Going back in time, looking at those first-hand accounts from folks in the 1800s, 1700s, or 1600s. The books are out there. The information is out there. It's just that you have to put an effort into it. One of the things that happened to us is that we have been dealing with lazy historians. Lazy historians. Lazy academicians have put information out there that causes us to have these problems today. So that's why today we're correcting history, not revising history. There are many who argue that focusing on the institution of slavery and the lives of the enslaved is too traumatizing. While some advocate that telling these narratives and new interpretations is the only path to healing. Can you all talk to us about your why? What's your reason for interpreting slavery? And how does trauma and the idea of triggering, uh, how do you deal with that at your sites? Um, I, I want to address this from two diff slightly two different perspectives because when we talk about trauma, we're talking about trauma that might be a lot for our visitors to experience, but it's also a lot for our staff to experience. And so there's two things that, um, that we need to do, uh, or that we do at our site. 
Um, one is to recognize that this is difficult history. This is challenging. It's difficult to talk about. Um, Julie Rose talks about this being the baggage that America does not want to talk about. It's its baggage. And, you know, we have, um, I, I think that when you saw the slide up there and you saw how we had kind of moved through these, addressing these different narratives that I shared a few minutes ago, um, we, we thought that, or we, we looked at that, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, um, I'm a Southerner and I enjoy my Southern heritage. My heritage does not have to be um, so fragile that I can't talk about the history of my own ancestors and really acknowledge what it is that my ancestors did and participated in and benefited from. And once I was able to get through that, and it's an ongoing process, and when you're working with this on a daily basis, you have to continually check yourself and your identity and recognize that I as an interpreter provide one perspective and the beauty about interpretation is when you can get different people from different backgrounds and different walks of life each providing a different perspective because um, what Shannon was, uh, what was referring to is that this is our story, this is an American story. So. Thank you. So let's talk about the issue of relevance. Why do historic churches and sites and house museums matter when we have access to information at our fingertips via Google and the web? I don't know if you saw on the slide that I had of the, uh, that, that was talking about the app that you could download, but did you notice the, the woman that was standing there and her hand was on the wall and she was taking a picture of her hand? You know what she was doing? Her fingers were inside of the fingerprints of a young enslaved boy that had flipped that brick while it was drying. The importance of these sites, the relevancy of these sites is just that. They are the places where this happened. And that's very important to have that connection to place, connection to landscape, connection to structures. Um, I get really frustrated when I hear sites talk about, oh, we don't have enough, we don't know enough. I don't believe that. It's all around us. And that sense of place is really important to making those connections. Well, um, we live in a world-class tourist destination. People are going to come here. Um, we need something for them to do that's real and, and important. Um, and I really believe in the guided tour experience and having human beings standing next to human beings. I mean, I, to me, the only other time that you do that with strangers is to go to church. Um, you know, who, you're with these strangers experiencing something together. I feel like that's very life-affirming when you're doing something together that's, um, that's relevant and, and, and interesting. So, yeah. yeah, I think there's something about uh, being in the space and feeling what a person felt. So you can read on Wikipedia, I'm sure, uh, exactly you know where slaves slept. Did they sleep on the floor? But there's something else when you're in the basement standing on the hard stone floor having those same thoughts or when you are uh, out in the Savannah heat in August thinking about the work that people did. Uh, it's a very different experience than reading about it from a remote location. What are the unique challenges to interpretation in his... I, 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 oh. did, I didn't get it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> well, I to feel history, touch it, smell it, and even taste it at times. I want you to gain a sense of spatial memory also. I want you to understand you're walking around hallowed ground, no matter where you are, every place there's some hallowed ground. Every place has a story. I want you to understand that, and you only get that by being right there. So that's all I'll say for right now, since you told me. <laughs> you indicated, Jamal, you're talking too much. Stop. No, you're not. Uh, so what are unique challenges to interpretation in historic cities such as Charleston or Savannah? <laughs> So, I, you know, people come here for Spanish moss and moonlight and mint juleps. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, managing expectations uh, is important. But I also think that's changing because more and more we're hearing people not say 
they want the romantic strolls through, through the squares. They're saying they want an authentic experience that is specific to this place. So I think that's been a challenge, but I think it's something that we're not going to see as much in the future. One of the issues that we have, and it comes, we come across this often um, from uh, Vaughnette Gill Walker, Footprints of Savannah, her tour uh, at First African Baptist Church, Queen Quet, we've had these conversations that often when people coming here with stereotypes in their minds. And they tend to think they know our story better than what we know our story. They tell us our story. They say, well, I saw this on television. I read this in a book. This is what they said. And we're saying, wait, wait a minute, they're absolutely wrong. And so they want to dispute us with regards to the information that we're not trying to correct. Because again, we're correcting the information. And so some of them have it embedded in their minds. And so we have to work on that. But also the other thing too is some folks are saying, how can we get us on the same page? Because you go to one site and they say one thing and then they come to your site, you say something else and they're saying, and it's like so far off, they say, Jamal, you keep talking about these captive Africans in the city of Savannah. We went over here and they said there were no Africans in Savannah. <laughs> and I have to look at folks like, what? <laughs> are you real? And then I say, because people are relying on us to tell the truth. And someone else says, well, we were told, you said they built this church at night? We were told that they had to be trained. Again, it's a little, what? <laughs> they came up with their skill sets, but again, it's like, how do we get other folks to now tell this, I try to be as honest as possible, or at least, as I say, explore and get the information. One thing I was saying, Charleston County, Charleston County used to have it so that their folks, if they had tour licenses, they had to basically have continuing education. In Savannah, we've been a wild west. <laughs> Spit it out. If the people don't know, and I tell folks, I say, they'll sell it to you. If you don't know the story, they'll sell it to you. Any, they'll sell anything to you. If you don't know the story, they'll sell it to you any way they want to. And so we have to work on that. That's one of the real issues that we have here. I want to echo Shannon's um, point is that people are coming to Charleston and to Savannah most often because they're here for vacation or they're here to have a good time. And it's difficult. It's a challenge. People come in with expectations. They come into our site specifically with expectations because they've never been there but they've been to other plantation sites and then when they arrive and they get a story that isn't what they were expecting. And one of the ways that we meet that challenge, and this is important no matter what, is that yes, this is a traumatic story. It is a difficult story, but ultimately this is a story of survival. And this is ultimately, for the four million people that survived slavery and were alive at the American, end of the American Civil War, and their descendants, this is, this is a positive story in, this, in, in that sense. And that's one of the things that at our site we endeavored to do, is to make sure that along with all of the, the horrors of what happened at places like McLeod, there were families that were made there. Yes, those families were torn apart oftentimes, but there's still joy that occurs and making sure that we're acknowledging the fact that there's an incredible local African-American Gullah Geechee culture that survives to this day. That's all part of a story of resistance and survival. And so it's important that we counter that, that the idea that this is just all a negative story so that, you know, so that when people walk away, that they aren't so crushed by the weight of this that they want to know more and they're provoked to learn more. Are historic houses and sites the key to understanding racial inequality, or is this an unrealistic goal for these institutions? I think that's an unrealistic goal for any single institution. Um, I think if, if we start a conversation that continues elsewhere, uh, I always say if people leave the Owens Thomas house and that night at dinner they're still having a conversation about something they learned on the tour, that we did a good job. And so I think we're a little piece in a huge puzzle that we all have to work on. But I will say that people don't know a lot. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I've had people that look nice and well dressed and, and come up and, and they were just like, and, and you had slaves here? And it's like, what did you think? <laughs> um, so, um, so while it's, it's one of the many keys, it's just a, a, a way of understanding. It's not the only one, but if, if they're not going to get it anywhere else, they're going to get it at our side. Um, so, um, it, 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 so it's not the key, but it's a key, I think, I hope. I think that um, collectively, yes. 
Uh, yeah, at one site it's difficult to do if you can get one person, but collectively, um, yes, it is um, something that is a realistic goal. Um, you know, a lot of people come from different backgrounds and maybe they come from disadvantaged backgrounds and they come to a site like ours and they see that and they recognize that um, and then they begin to share that story, their own story, and then a conversation starts. Um, and it's not, you know, being able to, to begin a, to address this is something that can happen at our sites and it becomes a mass kind of movement of, of every site, as, as you were saying, Jamal, about being, saying the same story. And if we're all doing that, then yeah, it becomes something that is a manageable and a, a expectation, I think. We're planting seeds. And we plant the seeds and that person will take it back to wherever they're from. And if it's nurtured, then it's going to grow. And I say that we have this sacred tree that now grows up to now help us tell our story. And this is separate from the George Lau vision, the first African, but I've seen where we plant the seeds, how we bring about change. When anyone talk, goes down on River Street, off of River Street to the Kluski embankments, that effort began based on some young people, children, taking a tour with me. Came and so five young black men, 12 years old and 13 years old, they went before city council and said, we want to take that one to the project. That came from a seed that was planted in them. Their parents and grandparents had heard the same thing, never thought anything of it. It was the young people, because now they had, his, they had history, not mythology. It invoked them now to go before the city council, and then you see, you go right down there today, and you see, bam, the embankment stores, done by young people. Young African-American men, 13 and 12 years old. One was now at Savannah State University. So again, I'm telling folks that's what happened. We plant the seeds to bring about change. I have one more thing that I wanted to add too, just about museums as institutions. And don't quote me, I don't know the exact number, but we are one of the most trusted institutions in the country. People come to us and when they come to us, they believe the things that they hear at our sites and they repeat them over and over again. We're much more trusted than Congress. <laughs> If you all would talk to us about resources, what resources have you used, need, or have had to create in order to interpret slavery? I created a book list um, to give the people when they come on our tours so that way they can know. And there's a range of books on the list. One book with regards to Savannah that I tell folks and people don't look at, Whittington Johnson's book on Black Savannah. That's an excellent book with regards to during that time period we're talking about, the time of captivity. Whittington Johnson, if you engage him in conversation, he even has gone to say, when I sat down with him, said that um, Father George Lau, Andrew Bryant, David George were all still having conversations even after Lau had gone to Jamaica. No one else talks about that because the thing we talk about, Africa's not knowing how to read here. But here it is, he's saying he's communicating, he's not keeping in, in contact with all the folks in Jamaica, the folks there in the Bahamas, in the U.S., in Canada, and even in Africa. That story doesn't come out. So Whittington Johnson, I'd say his book is one of the best books to get with regards to that story. So but we have a book list that we share with folks so that way they can know it along with any DVDs and, and the videos that they want to see. We're so lucky to be alive during this internet age where um, even if you don't have a lot of resources, if you've got the will to, to get online, you can avail yourself of just this world of information of census records, Ancestry.com, um, Savannah newspapers that go back to the 18th century. It's, um, it's sort of great for the geek in all of us. Um, and so, um, so uh, you know, it, it's, it's easier today than it was. But of course, go to the library, people. Um, but um, but uh, you know it, it, we, we can't uh, I, we couldn't be open without resources. It takes a lot of money around a house museum. So um, we're very fortunate that we exist in Savannah, Georgia, because if you blockade this house in the middle of, of rural Georgia, it wouldn't be open. So um, we we have to be aware. Um, of our visitor, what they need, and, and, and they need the story, um, and they like the story, and they want to know more about the story, and so it sort of feeds on itself. If they pay us admission, and we can keep the lights on, um, we, can, we can tell our story. 
Yeah, one of the resources that uh, we have used the most, and I know, Sean, you also do, is Interpreting Difficult History by Julia Rose, which is really a manual for how to do this work and uh, methods for planning to do this work. But um, I would also echo Jamie, museum work is not affordable. Uh, so financial resources are really important and not just admissions, our very generous donors help us do these projects. Um, so you know, when you all enjoy the panel this evening, think about our museums. <laughs> Um, training is super important. Frontline staff, I mean it's our staff that are out there on the front lines, the interpreters that are out there, the docents that are out there that are, are oftentimes in house museums that are making this happen. Just imagine what your house museum would be like if there was no docent there. And if that docent is, isn't prepared to have these difficult conversations, isn't prepared to really look at themselves and what they think about these, then this is something that is going to ultimately not succeed. Um, and in order for that training and that preparation to occur, that means that you have to have institutional support. And that means that institutional support has to come all the way from the board, all the way down to the, the, the supervisor that is, that is responsible for those docents and making sure that all of the resources that are there and recognizing that everyone has different needs. One of the things that's been one of my biggest challenges is recognizing as a white male interpreter that the needs of a young black female interpreter are vastly different than mine because she's going to have a vastly different experience and one that is much more personal. When I go home, I take my uniform off, she doesn't. And being able to provide her and people like her that support has been one of the biggest challenges for me, um, but it's also been one of the areas of the greatest growth. So preparation and training is probably what I would answer. One thing I did forget, because I know there's someone sitting out there who knows me, they're saying Jabal has not been forthright, so I'm going to let you know. There is a site that you can go to and read books from the 17 and 1800s. The University of North Carolina has a website called DocSouth. DocSouth, D-O-C-S-O-U-T-H dot com. You can read books from pretty much any aspect of Southern lifestyle. So yes, I go get some of the information from DocSouth, the books, and you can sit in your home, in your bed, <laughs> on your smartphone, your smart device, on your tablet, and read books from the 1800s that will give you a more accurate account of what was happening during the lifestyle back then. So I had to throw that out there because I want somebody to say, Jamal wasn't honest. <laughs> yes, I said it. Okay, DocSouth.com, University of North Carolina. So it seems to me that there is um, inherent risk in interpreting slavery. Risk of emotion, risk of alienating audience expectations and visitors, risk of investing time and resources into new narratives and ways of doing things. Would you all talk to us about your relationship with risk and why it matters? So at our site, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Shannon. Sure. Um, at our site, um, we don't have a, a scripted tour. Each of our tour guides, um, each of our interpreters, they come in and they develop their own tour based on our overarching themes. And it's an experiment at our site to see how that works. And the risk there is that we are, get, we are, what we're effectively doing is saying the gatekeeping of information that has been held by a historic curator for so long, we're removing that gate. And we're saying our interpreters have the ability and the skills to be able to do their own research and come up with their own tours. And the risk that is there is that if an interpreter is not prepared to do that work, then that tour can be a bad tour. But that's my job is to make sure that I'm there to help young new interpreters learn how to do, develop these tours. And so one of our risks is when someone is developing their own tour, people don't, as you were saying, Jamal, they're not coming here about me. Um, they're coming about all of the people that were at this site. And so it's really a challenge and a risk that we run that personal opinions get mixed into the story. And that's one of, I think, one of the biggest risks for my site. Um, so I'm lucky because when I came to Telfair Museums, they had already made the decision to take this risk uh, and committed to doing this work. 
But I would say besides the, the moral things that we've talked about that are reasons for us to want to do this, we also kind of touched on a little bit the fact that trends in the museum industry are changing. And so to not do this work is also risky. Historic house museums are closing at, at a very rapid rate. Uh, Jamie mentioned how lucky we are to be in Savannah, which is absolutely true. Uh, we have a large tourist audience who wants to visit our sites. Uh, places that you have to travel to go to a historic house are not seeing uh, those trends. And I think if we don't move in the direction that younger audiences are interested in, which is authenticity, change making, and social justice, that a, a lot of house museums aren't going to make it. We deal with the issue of people um, being offended. Being offended because now they're hearing something that they had thought that was not on the radar at all. They're seeing something, they're hearing things that in their mind's eyes, like this is incorrect and you're making it up. And then they want to battle us about that. So that's again, people being offended because now they're hearing some information that showcase the lives of the people properly. And they're so caught up into the stereotypes. And we had some folks come here uh, from Vermont, from New England area, basically, and they want the stereotypes. That's what they had been entrenched in their minds about the stereotypes. And so we have to deal with those folks and get them to understand that, no, we're going to give you the truth. And now what you have to go back and learn history. Again, as I said earlier, not mythology. And so I have to deal with those folks being offended that you have, and I have to say this, you have. African Americans who are giving this history out now and teaching them something that they did not know. Because they thought they knew everything. And I have, they thought they knew it. So now, and then when they pepper me with questions, I'm able to fire back responses to them. Now, they're like, wait a minute, I know better than this because no, Dr. So and so didn't say this. We're like, Dr. So and so is incorrect. This is information that's out there. You can read this and you can go to Doc South and get the book on such and such. Also. <laughs> that will correct that information. And so then, so some of them are a little stunned that they now see these young people, these middle-aged people now giving them history, information that they never knew about. And so, but we go forward, because we are custodians of the history. We are custodians, and so we must tell the truth. Um, as, as far as risks, the, the risks that I, because I'm a director, I'm not just a curator. I, I, every time we open the door, I feel like there's some risk that's going to happen. Somebody's going to fall down, somebody's going to get broken. But the, the risk that I worry about the most is that I put my people out there that, and they're not prepared enough um, to tell the story the way I would hope they would. Um, we've got just wonderful people, um, and, we, and we train by just, because we get, uh, uh, TripAdvisor. Um, we get uh, cr criticized for not saying the uh, well, you know, a terminology. So we're, we're we say enslaved uh, workers or bond people, and then they say, well, we're not saying slaves, and we're trying to cover it up. And then how do we prepare our docents to handle those kinds of? in your face questions, so that's what I worry about. I worry about my people not being prepared um, to handle um, stuff. Institutional change is a necessary uh, thing in order to make permanent impact. Can you share with us the process or steps for creating institutional change? At my site, the fortunate thing is is that we don't have an institutional history when it comes to this. So we've been very fortunate that we haven't had to change. We've been kind of forging and, and creating what is. So that'll be a better question at my site for the people that come after uh, me. But what I will say is because I work for Charleston County Parks, which does parks and recreation, our institutional change is being able to, be, being able to get our uh, people in administration to understand what it means to be a museum. And that is a very slow process of internal education that can be frustrating, um, it's very challenging, but that is, I don't have an answer other than we're trying to get there. For well, us, it's exploration, as I mentioned earlier, too. Exploration, looking at information, gaining information, researching constantly. Uh, for example, at First Afton, I've been working with folks and getting folks who do our tours, our docents, to let them understand that. Talk about the Underground Railroad. We know that the Underground Railroad is tied to Savannah. 
Now the way that it's tied to Savannah is a lot of mythology tied to that. And I tell folks, I say, it is tied to a man and a woman. And most people look, what, man and a woman? I'm like, yes, we have the, per the people that we can identify that were involved in, in Savannah. And so that came from doing the research, Deacon March Haynes, going back and reading the books from the 1800s. And we shared it here in programs here in, inside the Jepson. That again, Deacon Haynes and his wife operate a Maritime Underground Railroad. So we taught institutional memories. Folks have been told certain, some other things that first African with the gods of that history. And I'm telling folks, no, this is incorrect. We now have somebody we can properly identify in this area that was a hero during the Civil War, he and his wife. The connection to Fort Pulaski and to Hilton Head, so we now show that. And some people do want to fight against that because again, as we tell folks, it doesn't sell for some people. But I tell folks, I say when you give them the full story, guess what folks like say, that's more intriguing than a movie. <laughs> and that's history. So yeah, so we're constantly involved in the exploration, telling the story, finding out more. So again, to give a fuller view of their lives, of their history, of our area. So I think one of the most important things about institutional change is that it can't come from the bottom or the top. It takes every layer of the institution being on the same page to do that. So the interpreters and docents who are giving tours of these sites have to be fully engaged and have bought into the process, but so do the board members at the very top who are uh, funding and supporting that staff. So I would say that's probably the most important piece to me. What three things do you know for sure that you need in order to do this work of interpreting slavery? What are the three things that you know for sure? Um, we need historical resources, we need time, and we need creativity. Um, and um, still working on that, um, and good people. Um, the things that we need at this point are institutional support. I mean, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, and that institutional support has to be ongoing and, and a commitment to um, supporting what we're doing. And I don't know that I can think of two other things that are quite as close that we're not already try, um, addressing, at least to the best of our abilities. I think that that institutional support is super important. I think I would add to those things which are absolutely true, personal commitment. Um, it is not always easy to do this work and it is sometimes a little bit exhausting. Um, so deciding, deciding at the beginning when you start this work that it's a goal that you're going to see through is, is really important. I'm going to say you have to have good conduct, good character, and good speech. And for some people who understand African spirituality, that's what you have to be about, the honesty. Always exploring, always gaining, and not being afraid. So again, I say that's what I try to emphasize to folks, and realizing that sometimes you can make a mistake, but go and correct the mistake. Don't be afraid of correcting the mistake. So Sean uh, addressed a good portion of this, I think, in his earlier response, but I wanted to open it up to the rest of you all. The weight of historic and current racial tensions is, uh, is palpable. Do you have interpreters of color at your sites? And if so, how are you assisting them in creating a safe way to do this work of interpreting slavery? We do not. And it is something that we have struggled with and uh, attempted to gain more diversity in our interpretive staff. And you know, recognizing that, as, as Sean mentioned, this work can be a lot more uh, stressful and trying for African Americans telling the story. And uh, the experience and way they're treated by their guests can be very different. Uh, makes recruiting even more difficult. So if anybody has suggestions on increasing diversity in our staff, um, I would love to hear those and be open to that conversation. Well, um, we have a, a multi-layered staff, and most of our staff are volunteers, docents that are adults, and most of those are white. But we do have teenagers. We grow our own staff at the Davenport House. We have um, junior interpreters, um, and um, 
uh, 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 that's uh, I'm struggling with, with sensitivity and being able to to give them the tools that they need because they're diverse. They're wonderful students, um, uh, and um, we give them the story, and then we just put them out there. Um, and and um, so I, that's all I can say. I, I they I hope they have never come to me with any sort of struggle, um, and I would hope they would. But it's something that we're learning. We're trying to figure out as we go. But we feel like giving people the opportunity to interpret is, is a real cool gift and to be their first employment. So, you know, we, we struggle with it. Um, one of the things that has to happen, and this is, this is more of a challenge for sites that have been around for a long time, but um, I think one of the things is, is that, you know, you're not going to have a diverse staff at your site until a diversity of people can see themselves reflected in your site. Um, and so for a lot, many sites that have been telling one side of the story and not the whole story, that's one of the reasons why I think that African American visitorship to house museums and plantation sites is as low as it is. And I don't know what the exact number it is, but I'm pretty sure it's in the single digits. Um, and part of that is, is because for so long, the histories, it goes back to that annihilation, that, that, that early way that, that sites were being interpreted. And so until that, being able to see themselves reflected. And the other thing is, is that, you know, we require a great deal of education and very little pay. And that's a, that's a major issue for anyone, um, but it can be, it can be a real um, challenge for, for some folks. At FAB, everyone is a person of color doing our tours. So, yeah. so we have only African Americans doing our tours there. Um, but we're open to anyone because, again, part of FAB, First African Baptist Church's story, is also a spiritual story, too. So that's why we're receptive to anyone, and that's why you walk inside, then you see the curtains, and we tell folks the curtains on those same glass windows are open because everyone's invited to the house of God, and everyone's equal inside the house of God. So we're open to any and everyone to come, as long as you're going to tell the story correctly. That's all we want people to tell the story correctly. But, and I really didn't want to deal with that part for First African, but I wanted to throw this over to the Davenport House. Um, some 17 years ago, I sat down with Jamie and Raleigh uh, to discuss a living history program. And the first time they sat down, we sat down in the garden. We had a conversation about what we wanted to do for that living history program. And African, and Raleigh had his thought. I said, no, I said, what would be more intriguing, what would be better, Raleigh, is we had this person doing this. And Raleigh was receptive to it, and Jamie. I fell in love with them at that moment. <laughs> because what had been going on for so long here is that we had to battle folks about the respect of Africans in this city. So here it is, I'm sitting down with them now and telling about the character that I'm gonna create for them, that we could not do a living history program that was intriguing. People came and we got accolades for that, and still, to this day, still doing that. Every October we're doing that. But one of the things that have happened, and Sean threw it out there, that African Americans many times will not come to the presentation because they're so afraid that, again, they say, why would you choose to play a slave? I said, no, actually, I'm a free man of color. See, for them, not even thinking, because again, the stereotypes had in their minds, and so we have to deal with that. So yeah, so some people, they think at some of the facilities that it's not gonna be anything respectful to them and their humanity and the humanity of their ancestors. So it does become important for people to see folks who look like them, who respect, respect them. 